It is good to see you guys uh, here this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. That's where we're going to be this morning. And the scripture reading this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 18. Verse 18. And it says there, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Now, as we look and as we survey the season that we are in, we just had what? Holiday. Thanksgiving, right? And so about this time of the year, uh, Walmart, you know, starts to set out Christmas stuff at about September. Completely overlooking Thanksgiving, not giving its proper due, right? Uh, some families, like ours on November 1st, decide that we're going to free the tree. Uh, completely. Can you tell that I'm passionate about Thanksgiving? I really do believe we've got to get back to just, just let the holiday have its holiday, right? Uh, but I, I get the corporate schemes, you know, to... to get to Christmas as soon as we can so that they can get in the black. You know, I mean, even the day after Thanksgiving is what? It's called Black Friday, right? We just have a day where we're supposed to be thankful for everything we have, and then we trample over each other to get the best deal we can from Walmart and Target. It's just the dichotomy of the country that we live in. But as we look around, isn't it interesting that we set aside a total day, a complete holiday in which we're supposed to think about, in this season, really from Thanksgiving all the way to the end of the year, we, we are focused on being thankful and we're focused as a country on trying to do a good deed for people so that they might be thankful and that we might be thankful. But that isn't how it always is throughout the year, is it? Actually, that's sometimes not how it is in life. And Paul said something very interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. He said, not just be thankful. He said something that for us can seem really crazy. Be thankful in all circumstances. And, and even if you hadn't quoted it from the Bible, and even if you hadn't said that Paul said that, if you just walked up to people, you know, on the side of the street or in your, uh, or at your job or in your school, and you said, you know what, you should just be thankful in all circumstances, no matter what you might get a crazy look. Because let's be straight with each other. There are circumstances that we are presented with in life where I don't want to be thankful. It's hard to be thankful. I've got people at work that drive me crazy. I've got family members that drive me crazy. I've got classmates that drive me crazy. It's hard to be thankful in that situation. I've got sickness. I've got illness. I've experienced, you know, death in the family. I look at the, the landscape of the country. I look at the landscape of the world. I see all the death and violence, and, and it's hard to even think about being thankful. I've got my own personal, maybe some of us here have our own personal struggles and we have our own personal poverty maybe and, and life's just not going the way that we had always imagined it. Maybe for, you know, my, my family, you know, I, I had this grand vision of what we would be and what we would accomplish and, you know, over the last two, three, maybe 10, 20 years, you know, it just hasn't gone my way and it's hard to be thankful for that. So who is Paul, or how can Paul, writing this letter to the group of Thessalonians, you know, and as a Christian that I read that, how in the world can Paul sit there 2,000 years ago and write that sentence? Because everything intuitively seems to point to idea, uh, circumstances and situations where I shouldn't be thankful. And that's just not categorized down to a specific day of the year. But what's so interesting 
about what Paul says is this, and this is what's interesting, not interesting, but this is what's unique about God. I personally believe that God would never allow an inspired writer to write something and ask us to do something that we couldn't do. He's writing to a group of people who have their own idiosyncrasies. They live in a certain area. They live in a certain time frame. They are a group of people just like you and I. No different from us other than maybe culture and technology. And Paul still writes the words, be thankful in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. What would life look like if we could actually be thankful? Not just in the circumstances and situations that go our way. Not just in the predicaments we find ourselves in where everything is going good, but even in the times in which it seems really, really dark where things aren't going my way. And so what's interesting about what Paul says is that Paul gives some keys to being thankful in all circumstances. And what he does is so cool because what Paul has a tendency to do and what a lot of writers have a tendency to do in the New Testament is they bookend their books. What they start the book with is what they end the book with. And that's exactly what Paul does. And I believe that's where we find these keys to being thankful in all circumstances. So if you uh, are there in 1 Thessalonians, go ahead and turn over to chapter 1. One of the ways in which I can be thankful in all circumstances is understanding where I've been and where I am. Notice what he says in chapter 1, verse 8, 9, and 10. He says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and, and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turn to God from idols. You see, what had happened with the Thessalonians is that people started to receive reports about the work of God and the work of the gospel uh, in their area, in their city, and it wasn't like the Thessalonians went out and said, hey, this is what's going on and this is what happened, but because of their natural turning from idol worshipers to God worshipers, people heard about that. There was a report and it impacted the people around them. And so they were thankful, I'm sure, as those people were in Acts chapter 2, that they had gone from a state of sinner condemned to hell to saint saved in Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what takes place. See, they had turned. Their life was going in one direction and they had gone from there to God in the right direction. And in the hustle and bustle of the lives that we live in the 24-7 demand that we seem to have by everyone and everything, there are times where we need to stop, hit the pause button, and just say, God, I am thankful, just as these people were, to receive the report that the, Thessalonic, uh, that the Thessalonians had gone from idol worshipers to God worshipers. A couple of questions I want to ask us this morning. When do we meditate and thank God in reflecting on where we were to where we are? 
Because each morning that we wake up, we still face idols. We still face these kings and these queens uh, that are material in nature, that want to sit on the throne of our heart, and they want to dictate and control our lives. And if we separate ourselves from God in chasing and serving after those things, we will forget exactly who God is and what God has done for each and every one of us here today who are Christians. When was the last time that we thought about and we dwelt on the nature and person of God? That this God who we serve, this God who had turned the Thessalonians from idol worshipers into saints that had, uh, uh, you know, uh, assumed them into his body. That this God was the God that spoke the heavens and the earth into existence in Genesis chapter 1. That this was the same God that delivered children to barren people in Abraham and Sarah. That this was a God who had parted the Red Sea for Moses and the Israelites to get out of captivity. And they had consumed that he himself single-handedly with a body of water consumed the most powerful army in the world. That this was a God who had taken the weakest people of the weakest tribes, like Gideon per se, and used them as a source of strength. That this is the same God that in a moment of need stopped the sun for Joshua. That this was the same God that had delivered Israel from Babylonian captivity, that this was the same God that allowed Ezra and Nehemiah to reestablish the temple, that this was the same God who 2,000 years ago came in the form of human, in the form of a human being so that he might set his own creation free, that this was a God who peered down into the world. And said, in order to save them, I will become like them. That throughout the course of human history, it's this God that has played an integral part in seeing that lost people come into a relationship with him. That as Romans chapter 1 says, that his divine nature and his power have been revealed by what has been created. It's this God that in the moments of life in which circumstance and situation don't go my way, or even when they do go my way, I can take one thing to the bank, that he is active, that he cares, that he is not some distant grandfather on a rocking chair that just sits back and lets everything happen. And that without this God, There's no way that you and I or the rest of the world has any hope whatsoever. How could Paul write, be thankful in all circumstances? For this is the will of that very God that we just got done describing. And the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, were changed by that God to serve the living and true God. You want peace? You want to be thankful in all situations? Here's a quick, another quick question that you can answer that will let you in on whether or not you're thankful in all circumstances or situations. Where do you place serving God on your list of priorities. See, here's the thing. I can't entertain and I can't access the joy of an intimate relationship with God if I'm serving and entertaining other lovers that come to my doorstep. Those things of the world that seek to draw me away. And notice what else Paul talks about back in chapter 5. He says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus 
for you. See, other people might have ideas about what it means to serve God or what God might look like, but we see that the will of God is first and foremost contained in the person of Jesus Christ. Now look back in chapter one. Notice what it says there. That you serve the living and true God and wait for his son who is from heaven whom he raised from the dead, and that name is Jesus Christ. You know, no, another way that I can be thankful in all circumstances and in all situations, not just because there's this God that we describe about actually lives and he moves and he cares, but also because of the person of who Jesus Christ is. That he has set us free from ourselves. And not only that, is that he is the one who, you know, brought everybody into the kingdom. We see in Acts chapter 2, the initiation of what is known as the church. Ephesians talks about the church of Christ. Colossians talks about the Christ of the church. And that without him, none of what we've done this morning would be possible. How often do I reflect on that? How often do I meditate on that idea? Where is my focus when it comes to assuming the character of Jesus Christ? That as he has called me to be holy as he is holy, that can only take place in following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And you know what that means? That means sometimes that you and I have to do hard things. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says there that Jesus approached the cross and there was this joy that he had in going to the cross. That there is this joy that he had in saving people from themselves. That there is this joy that even though that there were people in his life that sought to kill him and the same people that sought to kill him ultimately did kill him. And they mocked him and they scourged him. And it was the Jews that stood there and say, oh, are you going to save yourself now? But Jesus, in that moment, Father, condemn, for they know not what they do. No. Father, forgive. For they know not what they do. And when I take on the spiritual walk of molding or allowing God to mold me in the likeness of Jesus, even in the bad situations, even in the adverse circumstances. You know what I can do? I can look and I can be thankful for those situations, not because those situations are appealing, not because I want to have or experience those situations, but because those are the same situations and the same circumstances that our own Savior walked in. And that, I can that he can relate to me in those situations. That I have an anchor. That I have a reference point that I can appeal to. Not so that everything will be honky-dory. But so that when I come through the other end of it, I can be more like him. And I can be thankful for those things. Now notice what else Paul instructs them in chapter 5. He says there, God in Christ Jesus for you. But he also gives a, what I call a negative command at the end of that. He says, do not quench the spirit. Or maybe another way of saying that is, do not resist the spirit. And we see in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is, and y'all sung the Sunday school song, right? Uh, the VBS song. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, it's always boggled my mind. And maybe it's because I'm not as spiritually mature as I need to be. 
how in every adverse situation that Paul faces, he writes and handles that situation always in a positive manner. Remember when Paul stood before King Agrippa in the book of Acts? And King Agrippa asked Paul a very interesting question. He looks into the eyes of Paul, who is chained and shackled, and he says, Paul, do you wish that I become a Christian? Now, for most people during that time, and I would even say today, to stand before any ruler chained and shackled as a prisoner of the state, and that question be asked, the logical thing to say is, oh, of course not, of course not. I don't want you to become like me because I'm shackled, because I'm a prisoner of the state. Actually, you know what, King Agrippa, your truth can just be kind of your truth, and my truth can just be kind of my truth, and we can just kind of sing kumbaya together just as long as you don't hurt me. King Agrippa, you and I, we are good to go. And that is the mentality of the world that we live in. That was the mentality of the world back then. And what is so crazy is that Paul looks at King Agrippa and he doesn't just say, King Agrippa, I wish that you would become a Christian. He looks and he says, I wish that everyone here would be as I am, less these chains. He wasn't talking about his physical predicament in which he found himself in. He talked about the spiritual predicament that he found himself in because he understood that while he was shackled, there was nothing that the king could do to shackle his spirituality. There's nothing the king could do to contain who Paul was. There's nothing that the king could do to shackle the gospel. Why? Because Paul understood and Paul possessed the fruit of the Spirit. Another instance, the gospel or the, uh, the epistle of Philippians, in which Paul is on house arrest. And we've talked about this before on Wednesday night. Paul is on house arrest and he writes, you know, you know, what has taken place here has what? It's been an ultimate negative, guys, that I'm just on house arrest and the gospel can't get out. No, that's not what he writes. He goes, hey, what has happened to me? He says, don't worry. I'm paraphrasing. He says, don't worry about me because what has happened to me has actually been an advancement for the gospel, for the whole Praetorian guard has heard the gospel. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Or when he writes to the Corinthian church and he talks about all of the things that have happened to him as how he's been whipped, you know, has been chased, has been shipwrecked, as he's been exposed and naked. And he says, you know what, know what my daily anxiety is? Not if I'm going to survive. But the church Because Paul understood that no matter what circumstance or situation he came across, the world might rob him of temporary happiness, but they could not take away his ultimate joy. But that can only happen if Paul possesses the fruit of the Spirit. And know what that calls us to do as Christians, that if we're going to be thankful in every situation, we should be thankful for who God is, we should be thankful for what Jesus has done, but we should also be thankful that we have access to the fruit of the Spirit, which is completely and to totally different than what we see in the world. The world might see temporary happiness, but the world and the idols of the world will rob people of ultimate joy. You want to go ahead and tell me and, and look each other in the eye and say, you know what, if I could describe the world and if I could describe the average workplace, it would definitely be self-controlled. Doubt it. If I look at the world and I look at the average family that doesn't have God, I would describe it as patience. 
And so this morning we have to ask ourselves, is our life a little bit off-centered? Is our life a little bit off-course? Because we haven't taken the time to really allow the fruit of the Spirit to penetrate our lives. See, it's hard to have a dysfunctional family when everybody lives by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's hard to get irate with a boss when you have those things. It's hard to be upset with a spouse when you have those things. And he's writing in a, in a situation in which he's trying to get the brothers and sisters uh, at, at Thessalonica to work together. And it's hard to have dysfunction at Thessalonica if everybody there is operating on the fruit of the Spirit. But if we have the fruit of the Spirit, we can be thankful in all circumstances. No, no. what's also interesting about this? What's interesting about this text is what's left out of the text. Notice that Paul, in talking about being thankful in all circumstances, never appeals to their bank account. He never appeals to how popular they might be. He doesn't appeal to how many Facebook likes they have. That's because they didn't have Facebook. He doesn't appeal to how many Twitter followers they have or whether or not they won prom king or prom queen. It doesn't, he doesn't appeal to what, how many degrees they've, degrees they've amassed through education. He doesn't appeal to whether or not your basketball team won or your football team won or what pro team you like. He doesn't appeal to how many corporations you own. He doesn't appeal to how many YouTube views you've gotten. Doesn't appeal to how many square feet you have on your house. In all actuality, he doesn't appeal to one thing that's material. Everything that is centered on being thankful in all circumstances and situations is centered on the spiritual. And if we find ourselves more often than not, not meditating on who God is, not praying about who God is and just being thankful for who he is, if we find ourselves not in the midst of trying to conform our lives, being transformed by the renewing of our mind, walking after the footsteps of Jesus, if we find ourselves more often than not looking more like the fruit of the world rather than the fruit of the spirit, then there is no way we can be thankful in all circumstances. There is no way we'll ever get to the spiritual maturity where we can look the culture, that we can look our circumstances in the eye and say, I wish that all people were as me except for this. And here's the reality of it this morning. For some of us, we're slaves to the idols rather than slaves to the Savior. For some of us, the reason we don't have peace in our life is because we haven't taken Paul up on the things that he mentions in the book of First Thessalonians. For some of us, the reason that we can't be thankful in all circumstances is because we've resisted the fruit of the Spirit. And notice finally, the last thing that Paul notes is this. In verse 23 through 28. Now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who calls you is faithful. He will surely 
do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Final verse, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This morning, what are you thankful for? Are you thankful for the God that exists and do we meditate it? Do we meditate on that often? Do we seek to conform our lives to the path that Jesus walked? Are we resisting the fruit of the Spirit? God offers and has always offered ultimate peace and ultimate joy to those who would answer the gospel call through repentance and baptism for the remission of sins and those who like the prodigal son who may have wandered far off, God sits on that path back home waiting for the sweet embrace and in that we can be thankful. If you need to respond this morning, please do so as we stand and as we sing.